thought I'd uh, spend a few days here at least um, going uh, back a, a bit uh, to um, uh, I, earlier on I did a, a little bit of reading from the great disciples of the Buddha uh, and I thought I'd do a more full-fledged uh, visit to at least some of them uh, and thought that uh, I'd start tonight with some readings uh, from that uh, on uh, Sariputta uh, and Moggallana. And when I was first researching and reading this and going back over it, I was trying to do Sariputta first and then Moggallana afterwards. And then just the way that both this book is written and the way that their lives unfolded, they're pretty inseparable. So um, I thought, well, I'll just kind of make it a little bit more organic. And uh, some of the passages will refer to uh, both of them uh, and their uh, growing up together, their lives together, and their search together for, uh, which ended up uh, uh, with the Buddha, finding the Buddha. Um, and then some of it is more oriented towards uh, singular uh, uh, comments or, or stories, uh, including, and most of what I'm going to do for the next few days is tending towards um, just more of the personal level of things rather than raw teachings uh, from either of them or uh, the other ones that I'm going to be covering too. Uh, so it's more of a chance to get more of a flavor of uh, the people, uh, the personhood of Sariputta and Moggallana and their journey and, and their place in the uh, Buddha's dispensation and, and their roles in the Sangha. Um, but also interspersed with the, some of the teachings just to uh, give a, a, a bit of uh, Dhamma perspective as well. But just use it as a, a way of appreciating the fact that there is a, a lot of humanity uh, in this. It's not just you know informational suttas, teachings that are kind of... Um, instructive or explanatory, but uh, that there was a whole uh, life of, of people uh, at the time of the Buddha, which you pick up, of course, in, in the Vinaya uh, a lot more than you do just in the Sutta Pitaka. Um, but uh, it's, you know, to me, it's indispensable to have that kind of exposure. It kind of gives a, a sense of appreciation and, and an enjoyment uh, of seeing the, the, the full uh, the full teachings coming from uh, actual real life people with personalities and things like that. So keep that in mind as we're going through some of this. So I'm going to begin with uh, the prologue to uh, the chapter on Sariputta in The Great Disciples of the Buddha. In many temples of Sri Lanka, you will find on either side of the Buddha image the statues of two monks. Their robes are draped over one shoulder, and they stand in the attitude of reverence with joined palms. Quite often there are a few flowers at their feet, laid there by some pious devotee. If you ask who they are, you will be told that they are the Enlightened One's two chief disciples, the Arhants Sariputta and Maha Moggallana. They stand in the positions they occupied in life, Sariputta on the Buddha's right, Mahamogalana on his left. When the great stupa at Sanchi was opened up in the middle of the last century, the relic chamber was found to contain two stone receptacles. The one to the north held the bodily relics of Mahamogalana, while that on the south enclosed those of Sariputta. Thus they had lain while the centuries rolled past and the history of 2,000 years and more played out the drama of impermanence in human life. The Roman Empire rose and fell. The glories of ancient Greece became a distant memory. New religions wrote their names, often with blood and fire, on the changing face of the earth, only to mingle at last with legends of Thebes and Babylon. And gradually the tides of commerce shifted the great centers of civilization from east to west, while generations that had never heard the teaching of the Buddha rose and passed away. But all the time that the ashes of the holy disciples lay undisturbed, forgotten in the land that gave them birth, their memory was held dear wherever the Buddha's message spread, and the record of their lives was passed down from one generation to another, first by word of mouth, 
than in the written pages of the Buddhist Tipitaka, the most voluminous and detailed scripture of any religion. Next to the enlightened one himself, it is these two disciples of his who stand highest in the veneration of Buddhists in the Theravada lands. Their names are as inseparable from the annals of Buddhism as that of the Buddha himself. If it has come about that in the course of time, many legends have been woven into the tradition of their lives, this is but the natural outcome of the devotion that has always been felt for them. And that esteem was fully justified. Few religious teachers have been so well served by their immediate disciples as was the Buddha. This you will see as you read these pages, for they tell the story of one of the two greatest of them, the Venerable Sariputta, who is second only to the Buddha in the depth and range of his understanding and in his ability to teach the doctrine of deliverance. In the Tipitaka, there is no connected account of his life, but it can be pieced together from the various incidents scattered throughout the canonical texts and commentaries in which he figures. Some of them are more than incidents, for his life is so closely interwoven with the life and ministry of the Buddha that he plays an essential part in it, and on a number of occasions, it is Sariputta himself who takes the leading role. As skilled preceptor and exemplar, as kind and considerate friend, as guardian of the welfare of the bhikkhus under his charge, as faithful repository of his master's doctrine, the function which earned him the title of Dhammasenapati, Marshal of the Dhamma, and always as himself a man unique in his patience and steadfastness, modest and upright in thought, word, and deed, a man to whom one act of kindness was a thing to be remembered with gratitude so long as life endured. Even among the arhats, those freed from all defilements of passion and delusion, he shone like the full moon in a starry sky. So this chapter on Sariputta is, is quite extensive, and as much as it would be fun to read the whole thing through, um, we'd be here for days. <laughs> so um, I thought I'd just do a quick summary um, of his earlier life and uh, his journey up until the point where he uh, stumbled on his meeting with Asaji, uh, which you will hear about in, in just a few minutes. Um, so basically, just to a, a very brief summary, uh, he and uh, who the man who became Mogalana, their names were Upatisa and Kolita, uh, uh, grew up as children together uh, in very close neighboring villages, and their families were very close with each other. And um, they were fast friends uh, from the beginning. Uh, and uh, I think as they were, when they were um, youths, I'm not sure exactly what age, but uh, somewhere in their youth, uh, they both had a kind of a mutually, um, a mutual event at a, at a, a hilltop festival that they went to um, where there was all sorts of entertainment and laughter and all that kind of stuff. And by the second day, both of them sort of came to realize the, the emptiness of it all, you know, sort of like, What's this all about? You know, why are we here? What's going on? This doesn't really make any sense. Why are we wasting our time? And um, they both uh, uh, expressed those thoughts to each other, having seen it in each other's face, and uh, decided that uh, they were, you know, they, they wanted out <laughs> of that whole scene. And so that was when they made their determination to become seekers. Uh, uh, through that kind of sense of uh, disenchantment, really. Um, so uh, they decided to leave uh, the uh, home life and become wanderers. And um, at that time, uh, they um, weren't sure where to go seeking, but um, they ended up... Uh, getting up with a, a, a spiritual teacher, a wandering ascetic named Sanjaya, um, who was sort of the closest thing they could find to somebody who might be able to help them with their, with their dilemma. Um, and basically, um, Sanjaya, uh, to sum up, there's a lot of information about him in, in this as well. 
um, was uh, you know a, an upright person, but his basic view you know it, it, for most of you probably know like there was extremely you know large number of different kinds of spiritual paths being practiced at the time, um, all the way from um, you know uh, uh, materialist uh, hedonist um, uh, Views to eternalist, nihilistic, you know, the whole range of philosophical uh, viewpoints that one can imagine uh, were ripe and being practiced at that time in India. So more likely they experienced a lot of those different kinds of uh, teachings. And the one they finally settled on was Sanjaya, who basically was a fairly confirmed agnostic. Um, and uh, so he basically, you know, all the different stances that one could take philosophically at the time in India, Sanjaya was basically uh, taking the, the viewpoint of, um, I haven't experienced it, I can't know, uh, so I'm not going to take any, I'm not going to take any stance. Uh, I take no stance on that view, I take no stance on this view, I take no stance on any views. Um, but there was something in him that they saw to, uh, to stay with. Uh, and after some time spending with him, um, and they had pretty much learned all of his teachings, and they realized that they hadn't reached their goal of seeing the end of suffering, which is what their primary motivation was. Um, and they asked him, you know, do you have any other teachings that revolve around this? And, his response was basically, no, you've, you've received all of my teachings. I don't have anything more to offer. Uh, and at that point, they said, OK. And they decided to go off wandering again. And so they left Sanjaya, went wandering uh, for a, a period of time more, probably experienced more teachers, couldn't find what they were looking for, and in kind of a bewilderment, ended up back in Rajagaha, where they had started, uh, and not quite sure. Uh, what to do at that point. Um, so that's a highly compressed version of, of that period of their lives uh, to the point where then they encountered one of the Buddha's disciples. So we'll start, uh, start with that. And if people are interested in going back to um, this book and reading more of it themselves, I'm jumping back and forth uh, on sections between uh, Sariputta and Mahamogalana because their lives, in the book especially, there's a lot of overlap. So back in Rajagaha, they are. One day, Upatisa, uh, to become uh, Sariputta, had gone to the town while Kolita had stayed at their dwelling. When Kolita saw his friend returning in the afternoon, he was struck with awe at the change in his friend's manner. Never before had he seen him so beatific. His entire being seemed to have been transformed and his face shone with a sublime radiance. Eagerly, Kalita asked him, your features are so serene, dear friend, and your complexion is so bright and clear. Have you found the way to the deathless? Upatisa then replied, it is so, dear friend, the deathless has been found. He then reported what had happened. In town, he had seen a monk whose whose behavior impressed him so deeply that he was immediately convinced he was an arahant, or at least one well advanced on the path to arahantship. He approached him and started a conversation. The monk, whose name was Asaji, replied that he was a disciple of the ascetic Gotama of the Sakyan clan, whom he referred to as the Enlightened One. And I think this is probably about six months after the Buddha's enlightenment, somewhere around there after the first rains retreat. When Upatisa begged him to explain his teacher's doctrine, Asaji modestly said that he was only a beginner and could not explain it in detail, but he could briefly tell him the gist of the teaching. When Upatisa er assured him that he would be satisfied with that, Asaji recited a short stanza that summed up the main points, a stanza that in the centuries and millennia to follow was to become famous wherever the Buddha's teachings spread. Of those things that arise from a cause, the Tathagata has told the cause, and also what their cessation is. This is the doctrine of the great recluse. When Asaji spoke this stanza, right on the spot, there arose in Upatisa the dust-free, stainless vision of the Dhamma. 
All that has the nature of arising has the nature of cessation. And the very same thing happened to Kolita when Upatisa repeated the stanza to him. Such sudden experiences of enlightenment may fascinate us and baffle us, particularly when they are triggered by sayings that to us seem so opaque and enigma enigmatic. But the power of the Dhamma to ignite realization of ultimate truth is proportional to the receptivity and earnestness of the disciple. For those who have long trained themselves in the disciplines of contemplation and renunciation, who have reflected deeply upon the impermanent and the deathless, and who are ready to relinquish everything for the sake of final deliverance, even a concise four-line stanza can reveal more truth than volumes of systematic exposition. The two friends, Upatisa and Kolita, were amply endowed with these qualifications. Single-minded in their quest for final freedom, they had learned to investigate things solely in terms of the conditioned and the unconditioned, and their faculties were ripe to the bursting point. All they lacked was the key to direct insight. Asaji's stanza was that key. Having swiftly cut through the subtle screens of ignorance that covered their mental eyes, in a flash it bestowed on them the first vision of the deathless. They had penetrated the Four Noble Truths and seen the uncreated, Nibbana, beyond the transience of phenomenal existence, where death ever reigns. They now stood securely in the stream of dana, assured that the goal was within their grasp. After Kolita had listened to that potent stanza, he asked at once where the great ascetic, the Tathagata, was staying. Hearing that he was staying not far away at the Bamboo Grove Monastery, he wished to go there immediately. But Upatisa asked him to wait, saying, let us first go to Sanjaya and tell him that we have found the deathless. If he can understand, he is sure to make progress toward the truth. But if he cannot comprehend at once, he may perhaps have confidence enough to join us when we go to see the master. Then, on listening to the Buddha himself, he will certainly understand. Thus, the friends went to their former master and said, listen, teacher, listen. A fully enlightened one has appeared in the world. Well proclaimed is his teaching, and his monks live the fully purified life. Come with us to see him. Sanjaya, however, declined their invitation, but instead offered to share with them the leadership of his community. If you will accept my offer, he said, you will enjoy abundant gain and fame, and you will be held in the highest respect. But the two friends would not swerve from their course and firmly replied, we would not mind remaining pupils for life, but you should make up your mind now, as our own decision is final. Sanjaya, however, torn by indecision, lamented, I cannot go. For so many years I have been a teacher and have had a large following of disciples. If I were to become a pupil again, it would be as if a mighty lake were to change into a pitcher. Thus conflicting motives contended within his heart. On one side, his longing for truth, and on the other, the desire to preserve his superior status. But the latter prevailed, and he stayed behind. At that time, Sanjaya had about 500 disciples. When they learned that the two friends had decided to follow the Buddha, spontaneously, all of them wanted to join. But when they noticed that Sanjaya would not go, half of them wavered and returned to their teacher. Sanjaya, seeing that he had lost so many of his disciples, was so stricken by grief and despair as the text tell us, that, as the text tell us, quote, hot blood spurted from his mouth, unquote. So they come upon the Buddha. Um, let's see. Essentially, just a... a Fast forward, they, they, they meet the Buddha and quickly receive the going forth <clears throat> and start their own practices separately from each other this time for a while, but it wasn't very long because Moggallana attained full enlightenment in a week and Sariputta in two weeks, so <laughs> they weren't separated for very long. Um, so just a brief paragraph uh, on Sariputta's uh, uh, moment uh, of enlightenment. But the Venerable Sariputta continued to stay near the master. Moggallana had, had moved away to be on his own for that week. <laughs> and um, Sariputta continued to stay near the master at a cave called the Boar's Shelter, 
depending on Rajagaha for his alms. Half a month after his ordination, the Blessed One gave a discourse to Sariputta's nephew, the wandering ascetic Diganaka. Sariputta was standing behind the master, fanning him. While listening to the discourse and following it attentively with his mind, as though sharing the food prepared for another, Sariputta reached the acme of, quote, knowledge pertaining to a disciple's perfection, unquote, and attained to arahantship together with the four analytical knowledges. His nephew, Diganaka, at the end of the sermon, was established in the fruit of stream entry. So it was while he was fanning the Buddha, listening to a discourse that he realized uh, arahantship which is an interesting point that you don't have to necessarily be deep in uh, some form of samadhi. Uh, well, you're in samadhi just by attentively, wholeheartedly uh, listening. That is a form of samadhi. And that was what form was needed for him at that time. So thus begins the dispensation of um, the, the two chief disciples of the Buddha who stayed with him until... Um, just before the Buddha's death, they both passed away, which will, uh, before the Buddha, just before the Buddha, which we'll get to eventually. But I'm going to just read a few pages about sort of his character, uh, some high points of Sariputta's character that became evident um, throughout the time that he, he spent with the Buddha. Among the bhikkhus, Sariputta was outstanding as one who helped others. In the Deva Daha Sutta, Sangyutta Nikaya 22, number 2. The Buddha himself said of his great disciple, Sariputta Bhikkhus is wise and a helper of his fellow monks. The commentary in explanation of these words refers to a traditional distinction among the ways of helping others. Sariputta was a helper in two ways, by giving material help and by giving the help of the Dhamma. Elaborating on the way he provided material help, the commentary says that the elder did not go on alms round in the early morning hours as the other bhikkhus did. Instead, when they had all gone, he walked around the entire monastery grounds, and wherever he saw an unswept place, he swept it. Wherever refuse had not been removed, he threw it away. Where furniture, such as beds and chairs or earthenware, had not been properly arranged, he put them in order. He did this so that the non-Buddhist ascetics who might visit the monastery would not see any disorderliness and speak in contempt of the bhikkhus. Then he used to go to the hall for the sick, and having spoken consoling words to the patients, he would ask them about their needs. To procure their requirements, he took with him young novices and went in search of medicine, either by way of the customary alms round or to some appropriate place. When the medicine was obtained, he would give it to the novices, saying, caring for the sick has been praised by the master. Go now, good people, and be heedful. After sending them back to the monastery sick room, he would go on the alms round or take his meal at a supporter's house. The above was his routine when staying for some time at a monastery. But when going on a journey on foot with the Blessed One, he did not walk at the head of the procession shod with sandals and umbrella in hand as one who thinks, quote, I am the chief disciple. Rather, he would let the young novices take his bowl and robes and go on ahead with the others, while he himself would first attend to those who were very old, very young, or unwell, making them apply oil to any sores that they might have on their bodies. Then, either later on the same day or on the next day, he would leave together with them. Because of his solicitude for others, on one occasion Sariputta arrived particularly late at the place where the others were resting. For this reason, he did not get proper quarters and had to pass the night seated under a tent made from robes. Having seen this, the next day the master caused the monks to assemble and told them the Tira Jataka, the story of the elephant, the monkey, and the partridge, who, after deciding which was the eldest of them, lived together, showing respect for the most senior. He then laid down the rule that lodgings should be allocated according to seniority. 
Sometimes Sariputta would give material help and the help of the Dhamma together. For example, when the monk Samita Gutta was suffering from leprosy in the infirmary, Sariputta went to visit him and spoke to him thus, Friend, so long as the five aggregates continue, all feeling is just suffering. Only when the aggregates are no more is there no more suffering. Having thus given him the contemplation of feelings as a subject of meditation, Sariputta left. Samita Gutta followed the elder's instruction, developed insight, and realized the six supernormal powers as an arahant. A sickbed sermon given by the elder to Anattapindika, the Buddha's chief patron, is preserved in the Sotapatti Sangyutta, Sangyutta 5526. In this discourse, given when Anattapindika was afflicted by such severe pain that he felt as if his head was being crushed, Sariputta consoled the great lay disciple by reminding him that as a stream enterer, he was utterly free of the bad qualities that lead to rebirth and states of woe, and that he possessed the four factors of stream entry, which are unwavering confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and the virtues dear to the noble ones. Moreover, he was securely established on the Noble Eightfold Path, and thus was certain to reach the fruits of the path, enlightenment, and deliverance. As Anattapindika listened to him, his pain subsided, and right on the spot he recovered from his illness. As a mark of gratitude, he then offered Sariputta the food that had been prepared for himself. Okay, so that's part way through Sariputta's life. And I thought I'd take a few minutes now to um, maybe just read a little bit. Sariputta you know, had a number of teachings that he gave that um, uh, are actual suttas themselves uh, with him as the, the speaker. Uh, and you know, some of them are, are wonderful and brilliant. Um, some of them are fairly long and quite detailed. It shows the wide range of his analytical knowledge as well as his, um, yeah, his master of Dhamma, the foremost in, in wisdom uh, of the Buddha's disciples. Um, and I was trying to think of one that might give sort of a, uh, an overall representation of just sort of the, the range uh, of his abilities. And, um, the closest I could come was uh, the Sangyutta, I mean from the Maha, Majima Nikaya um, called the Mahavedala Sutta. It's number um, 43 in the Majima Nikaya. And uh, it's translated as the greater series of questions and answers. Um, so it's essentially just a, a series of questions and answers uh, that uh, I think is has quite a lot of very good dhamma in it. So I thought I'd read, maybe do half today and half tomorrow. It's, it's not that long a sutta, but it's a, I'll maybe read a little bit slowly so people can kind of chew on it. And you know, if you any questions come up from it, then uh, we'll have some, a little bit of time for that as well. So this is number 43 from the Majjhima Nikaya, the Mahavedala Sutta the greater series of questions and answers. <laughs> Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jeta's Grove, Anadapindika's Park. Then, when it was evening, the Venerable Maha Kotita rose from meditation, went to the Venerable Sariputta and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the Venerable Sariputta, in just a minute, I will look at a footnote first. Yeah, the footnote on, on that is that Venerable Maha Kotita was declared by the Buddha the foremost disciple of those who have attained the analytical knowledges. <coughs> Patisambhida. So he's no slouch either, you know, and he and Sariputta having this Dhamma conversation. So he asked the question, one who is unwise, one who is unwise is said, is said, friend, with reference to what is this said, one who is unwise. Sariputta replies, one does not wisely understand, one does not wisely understand, friend, that is why it is said, one who is unwise. 
And what doesn't one wisely understand? One does not wisely understand. This is suffering. One does not wisely understand. This is the origin of suffering. One does not wisely understand. This is the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand. One does not wisely understand, friend. That is why it is said, one who is unwise. Saying, good, friend, the Venerable Mahakotita delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Sariputta's words. Then he asked him a further question. One who is wise, one who is wise, is said, friend, with reference to what is it that one, that one says, one who is wise. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friends, friend, that is why it is said, one who is wise. What does one wisely understand? One wisely understands this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend. That is why it is said, one who is wise. So basically taking it back to the Four Noble Truths, we always need to come back to that. Next question. Consciousness, consciousness is said, friend. With reference to what is consciousness said? Sorry, Puja's reply. It cognizes. It cognizes, friend. That is why consciousness is said. What does it cognize? It cognizes this is pleasant. It cognizes this is painful. It cognizes this is neither pleasant nor painful. It cognizes, it cognizes, friend. That is why cognize, consciousness is said. Footnote. The question, this is from the commentary, uh, commentary, uh, ex extrapolation on this. The question concerns the consciousness with which the person described as the one who is wide examines formations. That is the consciousness of insight by which that person arrived at his attainment, the mind which does the work of meditation. Venerable Sariputta answers by explaining the meditation subject of feeling in the way it has come down in, in the discourse on the foundations of mindfulness. So he's basically just offering an illustration. He's not saying that this is the only thing that is ex explained uh, uh, by consciousness, but he's offering this uh, cognizing um, of uh, the experience of feeling as an example. And I think it's important to note, and will come out in the next few questions too, that the basic thrust of this is um, whether it's uh, consciousness, feeling, perception, which are coming up. The basic thrust is that he's pointing to um, the non, uh, the not self aspect of uh, consciousness, feeling, perception, all of these uh, mental faculties, uh, mental factors, and experiences. Um, so, consciousness basically is the process of cognizing. It's not uh, anything to to reify. Next question, wisdom and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them? Wisdom and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. For what one wisely understands, that one cognizes. And what one cognizes, that one wisely understands. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. What is the difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness, these states that are conjoined, not disjoined? The difference, friend, between wisdom, con wisdom and consciousness these states that are conjoined, not disjoined, is this. Wisdom is to be developed. Consciousness is to be fully understood. I'm going to read a couple of footnotes on that. Uh, the first one about them being conjoined and not disjoined. Um, the two are conjoined in that they arise and cease 
simultaneously and share a single sense base and object. However, the two are not inseparably conjoined since while wisdom always requires consciousness, consciousness can occur without wisdom. So I thought that was a useful clarification from the commentaries. Feeling. Feeling, feeling is said, friend, with reference to what is feeling said. It feels, it feels, friend. That is why feeling is said. What does it feel? It feels pleasure, it feels pain, it feels neither pain nor pleasure. It feels, it feels, friend. That is why feeling is said. Perception, perception is said, friend, with reference to what is perception said. It perceives. It perceives, friend, that is why perception is said. What does it perceive? It perceives blue, it perceives yellow, it perceives red, it perceives white. It perceives, it perceives, friends, that is why perception is said. So that example, that is you know, one example of perception. Of course, there's many other examples of perception other than colors. He's using that as an, just as an illustrative uh, uh, example. Rather, rather than as a doctrine that that's all there is that, perce that perception involves. Again, pointing the phraseology, uh, it perceives, it perceives, and feeling it feels, it feels, pointing again to that, that there is no owner who is perceiving, there is no you know, independent self who is feeling, perceiving. It's just processes that are occurring. Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them? Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. For what one feels, that one perceives. And what one perceives, that one cognizes. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. Last one I'll read, which is about halfway through. <clears throat> Friend, what can be known by purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties. And he's referring to the five sense-based faculties here of uh, uh, eye and forms, <clears throat> ear and sounds, uh, smells, tastes, and tactile sensations, those realms of the five uh, physical senses, five, sense, five physical sense faculties. <clears throat> so friend, what can be known by purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties? Friend, by purified mind consciousness, um, which would be mano vinyana, uh, released from the five faculties, the base of infinite space can be known thus. Space is infinite. The base of infinite consciousness can be known thus. Consciousness is infinite. And the base of nothingness can be known thus. There is nothing. Friend, what does one understand? With what does one understand a state that can be known? Friend, one understands a state that can be known with the eye of wisdom. Friend, what is the purpose of wisdom? The purpose of wisdom, friend, is direct knowledge. Its purpose is full understanding. Its purpose is abandoning. And that aspect of wisdom, understanding, um, a state that can be known, um, uh, is a you know, looking at it through the lens of Dhamma, looking at it through the lens of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, uh, to come to that sense of direct knowledge of uh, the, uh, you know, the discerning mind, seeing things as they are, uh, with the purpose of full knowledge, understanding, and abandoning, letting go through clear seeing. So I'll stop there for now, and just thought that that was a, so far, um, to be continued tomorrow, uh, a, a nice example of the, the range and depth of Sariputta's wisdom and how he's able to just answer these questions from a, uh, a very astute fellow uh, monk as well.
So uh, I think I'll leave it there for uh, this evening. If there's any thoughts or comments or questions. Uh, what is meant by the signless, signless concentration? Signless concentration. Okay. It must have come up in something you read recently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a um, uh, signless com uh, concentration. I think the Pali would be animita um, samadhi. Um, it's also um, referred to that and the other forms that often come with that kind of uh, uh, discussion on, on different kinds of concentration also as the animita emancipation, um, uh, signless uh, uh, freedom or not, I'm not sure, release, I guess. Um, um, and signless generally refers to when uh, that kind of concentration, when one enters that kind of signless uh, concentration, uh, it is usually uh, based on the contemplation of uh, uh, anicca, uh, uh, impermanence, the transience. So that um, essentially, um, as I understand it, and I'll ask Lung Pao to expound as well, um, that uh, as uh, one is contemplating uh, different experiences in their arising and persistence and passing, the uh, the transience of um, uh, experience, whether it's like in the sensory realm, sight, sounds, tastes, <clears throat> smells, tactile sensations, thoughts, you know, within the realms of the six sense bases, one is watching arising and passing away. Um, then, um, or in contemplation, say, of the body, the khandas, the aggregates, um, then. Uh, when one is seeing that uh, clearly um, one doesn't uh, get lost in appearances, the sign, that's what nimitta refers to, is like the apparent uh, appearance uh, of uh, uh, things such to the point where we uh, concretize them or objectify them or establish identity around if it's within ourselves or establish identity outside of us, you know, as something separate uh, in an experience, a, a self and other kind of thing. Um, so that uh, in, in the contemplation, one develops that concentration, that, that composure of mind around that theme, uh, and uh, then one experiences the, the effect of that as not, uh, not attending to um, something that, that then presents itself as uh, as permanent uh, as, uh, or particularly as self as well. That's how I understand it, Mungpa. Anything to Okay. So that's what's known as the uh, Animita Samadhi. So uh, the word wisdom always, uh, how should I say, is when I hear wisdom, maybe because I'm not a native speaker, doesn't mean anything at all to me. Mm. Uh, but when I hear uh, Tanisa Rubiku's tr translation as discernment, mm -hmm. it's really meaningful. Because, mm -hmm. oh yeah, this, you discern this and that. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can uh, say something about that uh, choice of translation, uh, or maybe you can tell me like, something, like, a better way to understand wisdom, like that, that word, mm -hmm. that is a little more, maybe it can make more sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think discernment's a good uh, a good one. If you're comfortable with that and that makes sense, then stick with that. <laughs> it's a very good translation. Panya, uh, the Pali Panya, uh, is what we're referring to. Uh, translated discernment, wisdom. Yeah, wisdom has just sort of been the traditional translation that's come down um, over the years and has been picked up and used by most uh, Westerners. Uh, for translate, uh, translating of, of Panya. Um, and generally, it's, you know, one has to distinguish that from the common usage of, in English, uh, of the word wisdom, which, you know, you think of, you know, a sage old person with a white beard, <laughs> you know, expounding, you know, very uh, lofty philosophical treatises. Mm -hmm. Someone with a lot of knowledge, a lot of intellectual knowledge is somebody who has 
generally referred to as somebody with great wisdom. Uh, in the Buddha's teaching, Panya refers more to a broader range of, of qualities that are uh, based on clear seeing, essentially as the, as the root uh, mind quality that results in the arising of Panya or discernment. Uh, so that, um, you know, and, it, and, and really, uh, oftentimes we think of it, and, and, and you know, often t- most often it's referred to in the qualities of seeing uh, through, uh, through insight, you know, the qualities of anicca, dukkha, anatta, that is seen with, with panya, uh, seeing the, uh, those three qualities of uh, 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 impermanent suffering and not self. Um, it's also, um, also though, referred to more um, uh, less lofty uh, forms of discernment, um, such as particularly uh, along the lines of uh, the arising of wholesome and unwholesome qualities in the mind, being able to discern with panya, and being able to discern what's an unwholesome state uh, and the appropriate response of being abandoning it and what's a wholesome state of mind in the response of, of cultivating that. The hindrances, um, you know, uh, various uh, of, the, of the parami, say, recognizing those. Uh, anything that's um, recognizing things along the lines of dhamma that result in uh, uh, picking up uh, skillful qualities and, de- and developing them and uh, abandoning unwholesome qualities can be fit in that category of panya or discernment. And that's why discernment is probably a better word in some ways than wisdom, because one doesn't normally think of wisdom as that kind of uh, uh, examination and reflection uh, and understanding.